So, so this is uh, one theme. Theme is producing Schutzenberger-like theorems, which is theorems of the form a language is definable in such and such logic if and only if it's 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 monoid has such and such properties and there's a lot of research in this direction, which I personally enjoy a lot. And uh, one of the things, one of, so what's the point of such research? The way it's usually solved is that it allows you to decide, have an algorithm given an MSO formula, is it definable in first order logic? And the algorithm is you compute the monoid and you check if it has a property. But this is ridiculous. I mean, nobody cares about an algorithm. Few people care about an algorithm which decides. What it really does, it gives you an insight into the inner structure of the logic, which insight can then later be used for, for doing other things. And that, that's what it's really about. And, uh, uh, so, so when you, you publish these Schutzenberger-like uh, results, do you not get um, uh, uh, replies from the evaluation that, oh, actually this was a result of Schutzenberger uh, buried in some... Uh, That's just the incompetent Schutzenberger people who get this problem. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think there's like five papers by Schutzenberger or something. I know what you're speaking about. Uh, because I saw this review for one of your papers, oh. <laughs> and I know who did it. <laughs> but that's a different theme. That's about. Uh, <laughs> uh, I should say Berger is like Cousseau, right? I mean, everything. Uh, I, was go I was going to mention yeah, yeah. Cousseau too. Uh, yeah. I've done everything. <laughs> yeah. Schutzen Berger is, is, is a larger than life figure. It's. Uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's a, oh, we'll, we'll get to that maybe later. Uh, okay. Uh, but here's one thing that uh, I wanted to discuss uh, now, which was supposed to be the end of the previous lecture, but I think it's a very nice application of monoids different than Schuttenberger. So remember this data structure for parallel evaluation, okay? And this will allow you to evaluate uh, the, the value in logarithmic time. Logarithmic parallel time, yes? Let's try to bring it down to constant time. Uh, so that's what we're going to do now. And for this, we're going to use an, a, a non-trivial, but not very difficult, maybe we can even try to prove it or not. I'll see a result, OK? So, I want this to do this in constant time, which means that I want this, this, this tree to have constant depth. But the words can be very long, so if it's going to have depth, constant depth, say, 5, then clearly you cannot have binary branching, because then you can only do a word of length 32. Uh, so you're going to need to have large uh, fan in of the gates. So what kind of trees can you use? And this is something that's done in the, Schutten, uh, in the Schimann theorem, and this is what I will describe to you now. So suppose a slightly, yeah, I can use this, this thing. First order, or first order logic is AC0. It's a good question how this, uh, I don't think, this, this applies to beyond first order logic. Uh, first of all, it applies to, and I don't think there's any connection between the two results. It's, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, but I don't think it's, uh, I don't think there's a connection here of the data structure that I will describe with AC0. So this, this works for, uh, this is going to work for arbitrary monoids in particular beyond first order. Uh, so we're used to the following data structure. So suppose you have your input word and you have a homomorphism into a monoid. So here you have the values of the individual letters. In this naive data structure that we described previously, you were allowed to join two elements into one and then doing this in a balanced way, you would, could get a single tree of, 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 of logarithmic depth. Uh, so we are still allowed to do that. So we're still allowed out to join two elements and without any preconditions. And maybe here, uh, but we are also allowed to join lots of elements, like here. But this you're not allowed to do always, you're only allowed to join lots of elements if they are the same element. So you build a tree so that you join two elements 
anytime you wish, but you join many elements as long as they're the same one. That's the two type of things you can do. So you can have arbitrary fan in as long as all inputs have the same value. In, part, in this particular case, not only is this a, is the same value, but zero is an idempotent, which means that zero dot zero is, is zero again. So this, this value of the output is going to be the same as the value of the input. And you could pl place that restriction as well if you wish, but in the, in the interest of simplicity, no. It's just the same value. So these are the two types of rules you can do. You can join two elements whenever you wish, and you can join more than two elements, such as three, as long as it's the same one, so in this particular case, a one. A one, for example, is not idempotent, so if I had, this, is, this I believe is, uh, the monoid is Z2, so if I joined four ones, it would be uh, zero, okay? So these are the two types of rules you're allowed to do. Join two elements whenever you wish, and join more than two elements, as long as they're the same one, okay? Compute the value in the monoid, okay? So you have an input word, and then you have construct a parse tree, with either binary gates or non-binary gates, and the non-binary gates need to use the same argument m multiple times, okay? And you could place an additional restriction that the non-binary uh, gates not only need to have the same argument, but this argument needs to be idempotent. That would be a further restriction and the theorem would still be true. But let's forget that, just to make it simple. So let's call this an H factorization. And of course, uh, Factorization like this is a special case. You don't use the, you only use binary gates, but uh, using the, 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 the non-binary gates, you can maybe lower the depth, and you actually can. So here's the, the, uh, the theorem. It was proved by Imre Shimon that for every homomorphism into a finite monoid, you can create such a tree such that the depth of this tree is of this size. It's constant depth. It depends only on the monoid and does not depend on the size of the input. And uh, using this theorem, uh, it, you can get a lot of applications of this. One of them you will see in the fourth lecture. Uh, but one application you could get is uh, that you can evaluate, you can get linear time uh, model checking algorithms for certain logics where the natural algorithms would run in time n log n. And you can drop this down to linear time. For example, x path. This is something that we did together with Pavel Paris, but I don't think I'll have time to discuss that in any detail. However, what I think I'll try to do, uh, we'll see what that will cost me, is to prove this theorem, just so that you get a feeling of how you use uh, semigroups, how you use monoids. Okay? So let's prove this theorem. It says that no matter what homomorphism you have, into a finite monoid, you can always find such a tree of fixed depth, okay? And here you will see how, this did, how the monoids start to have an advantage uh, over automata because you can do things with them which are not so clear for automata. So let's prove this theorem. I will prove a slightly weaker version. The bound is not going to be 3m, but it's going to be a constant. It's going to be 2 to the power of m, or it's going to be exponential in m. But importantly, it's a constant which depends only on the monoid and not on the input word that's being parsed, okay? So I want to show that for every input word, no matter how long it is, I can have a factorization whose depth is, is just bounded by a function of the, of the monoid, okay? And uh, I will prove this theorem by induction on two parameters. Oh, we'll, we'll see the induction thing. Uh, but the proof strategy is two steps. First, I consider the case of, uh, ah, the, the, for the optimal bound, you need to know a little bit more about monoids. It's also interesting, but you need to use these J classes and stuff like that, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, and the proof, I will do it in two steps. First, I will consider the special case when the monoid is just a group, an important type of monoids, groups. And then the second case is using groups will generalize it to the generalized, okay? So uh, let's do it for groups first. So uh, what I will show is that for every word W, I can have a tree whose depth is this. It should say depth, I'm sorry. I have a, can have a tree whose depth is this, where this is a parameter uh, which is uh, at most uh, three times the size of the group, 
So what is this parameter? I define, let's take that the group is, say, Z3, OK? And our input word I could have had twos here as well, but let's say I just have ones, okay? Uh, what I do is first, whenever I have a sequence of consecutive zeros, these are, I can use, I can group them into a single zero, yes? I am actually assuming I didn't put them because I am. So I will make it a, a, even a stronger one, but uh, so I will pr produce a, uh, a more restricted thing. And now I think all of the zeros have been grouped together, okay? And now I group, uh, there's still some zeros left, and I group each zero with the adjacent one. No, no grouping needed here. Oh, let's put it this way, and maybe with the next one, just to be Yes. That, that's exact. That's that. that uh, so I, uh, the first step, I got an alternating word where, where the z only sometimes you have uh, you don't you have consecutive ones, so it's not zero one. So essentially, now now what I have, if you look at it, is just ones. And now you group them into groups of three. So technically speaking, you need to do, uh, to do two steps. So this is a group of three. Oh, actually, it's all ones, so I can just, I, I'm done. But if I required it to be idempotent, I could group them into groups of three. And there's some left over at the end. And then I have zero. And I have lots of zeros, and then I group them into one big zero. And then I add this. And if you think about it, this type of argument works in any cyclic group, and if you think about it a little bit more carefully, it works in any group. So in a group, your strategy is to group it into groups which evaluate to the identity element of the group. And it doesn't take too much time to do that, and, uh, and that's what you do. Uh, and here we're using the fact that we can talk about groups. And for automata, uh, groups appear, mm, are less enthusiastic to appear. It's, uh, but we'll see, see how they appear anyway in a moment. So the conclusion is that the, the recognition problem for any regular language is in uh, what, AC0? What does it this is not, well, so that's connected to your question, but actually I, I don't think that's, that, that's, that's true. So let's go back to the picture. So what you see is that this data structure that we'll see in a second, but the data structure, it depends on the input. So if you take the binary branching, it doesn't depend on the input. But here, it depends on the input. Where you're allowed to use these large fan and gaze, that depends on the input. And this is very important, because if it did not depend on the input, uh, that would have some consequences which are not true. <laughs> uh, so for example, it would allow you to do these updates in constant time just by fixing it uh, along the path to the root, which is not true according to uh, what as proved by Peter Brom Nielsen. So that's, uh, that's, you cannot do that. Well, uh, yes, Sujit? No, so here, uh, every node is basically computing a product of a group. This is not possible in a constant depth circuit. And uh, an AC0 circuit can't do it. Yes, but what you could imagine is you could imagine extended circuits with group group. No, no, but the point is, it's not the standard notion of in a standard circuit, the circuit exactly. should not depend on the input, it just depends so on the length. That, that, Even in the non-uniform model, yes. it only depends on the length, not yeah. on the actual data. So, yeah. Yeah. so that, that's the difference. This says nothing about circuit complexity, yeah. But maybe in some deeper sense it does, but I don't see that deeper sense. 
but definitely not in direct sense. Okay, so that was part of the proof. Let's continue. So we did the group case. Um, if you think about it, you have to. Well, there's a proof. You can see. Uh, uh, you can see the slide. But as you can see, what's important is that your strategy is to find lots of consecutive identity elements in the group, and that's you can you can succeed then. And then, if you think about it, you can do it. The slides are on the on the web. Let's now do the general case. Okay, so we know how to do it for groups. And actually the proof does, uh, for groups that I gave here, gives the optimal bound of three times the size of the groups. Where did we use the group? The group has inverse. Where did we use inverses? Well, we use, well. You used the fact that it was a cyclic group on the board. On the group, on the board, I used the five of Z3. <laughs> uh, no, no, but this would have worked for Zp in general. It would have worked for Zp in general. And now, uh, if it's a not necessarily cyclic group, uh, then uh, you use it in the following way. Uh, I will not go into the entire details, but what you do is you evaluate prefixes in the group. Okay, so you have you, you have an input word, and you evaluate prefixes, like you run the automaton left to right, and for each prefix you check the value in the group. By the celebrated pigeonhole principle, there's going to be some element of the group that will appear many times. Okay. And now let's to look at what happens in between two consecutive appearances of this element. In a group, if you see two consecutive appearances of the same element, that means that the part in between needed to have identity value in the group. And that allows you to make some reasoning. That's what's going on. That's how you use the group. And then you have to, of course, do the proof on top of that. But that's what's going on. Now let's do the general case. And so I just want to have one proof which just goes to to see more in detail how do you use semi groups in monoids. So now we want to do the general case. So we want to give this constant depth uh, trees for every uh, monoid homomorphism. And uh, we will do this by induction on two parameters. Uh, the main parameter is going to be the side of the monoid. So if we manage to decrease the size of the monoid, we're done. And we are also allowed to keep the size of the monoid the same, but decrease the, the alphabet here. That's our second parameter. The alphabet should be viewed as a set of generators. So it's two parameters lexicographically. Okay? And uh, we will prove it by induction on these two parameters. So, and this is where you get the suboptimal bound because if you think of the, the, the depth of the induction, you figure it out, it's going to be exponential in the size of the monoid. And, and, and not 3n. That, that's where we get the suboptimal bounds. And I believe that the proof that I'm presenting here is, I think, the original proof of Inner Shimon. Uh, so let's consider two cases. The first case is that there is some letter in the alphabet, which should be viewed as a generator of the monoid, which has the property that if you multiply the monoid to the right by this letter, you get a proper subset. So you consider this is all elements of the form, some element from the monoid times this. It could be the case that there's like a decreasing element. Okay? Decreasing element sounds promising. And it is. So let's, let's, we'll show that then we can use the induction assumption by this decrease. So the first observation is that this subset here, it's a subset of the monoid, and it's a proper subset, so we can apply the induction assumption to it, is, well, it's smaller, but it's also a monoid because it's closed under multiplying elements. Because if you multiply two elements with an element belongs to the subset if it ends with H of A. If you multiply two elements which end with H of A, then the result also ends with H of A. It doesn't have unit. It doesn't have unit. So technically speaking, I should have from the beginning talked about semigroups. So if you do this pr proof in terms of semigroups, then this is, this, this, this is actually what's going on. So that's why it says here in very small font, it's actually a semigroup. So I should have done it in terms of semigroups. Uh, okay. And uh, now I'm going to use that to create the, the tree. So I have an input word. <laughs> There's too many vowels. Uh, and not a single Z. That, that, that. Uh, and what I do is I, well, I have this allegedly exists, this, this letter here which decreases it. So I see where, where does it appear? So these are the occurrences of the letter A. This is the letter which decreases our monoid. Okay, so I just identify all positions where it appears. And now what I have is that 
in between appearances of A, I have a smaller alphabet, yes? So I can use the induction assumption of the smaller alphabet and have a factorization forest for the part here and here and here and here and here for each part which does not use this special letter right? of constant depth by induction assumption. But, but in theory, you could reintroduce the A. And now I can reintroduce the A, which is what I'm doing right now. So I... I and now the red points, the, they're in a smaller monoid. So I can get a new tree, again of constant depth, and that's the depth I get. And then there's this rubbish afterwards, which I just need to add in one last step. The end of the proof. Okay, so it's a very simple proof. Uh, so if I have a letter which decreases, I'm done. But what does it mean to not have a letter which decreases? And essentially, it means you're a group. So I'll try to explain this in more detail. So if case one does not hold, it says that for every element, every letter A, it does not do this. Which means that multiplying by that letter gives me the entire monoid, which means that multiplying by that letter gives me a bijection on the monoid because we're talking about a finite set. So, you know, if it doesn't decrease, every element gets mapped to exactly one. Element. That means that if I do not have case one, then for every element A, the function input something and multiply it to the right by H of A is a bijection of the monoid. Symmetrically, I could have applied case one with H of A being on the left. So, for the same reason, I can assume without loss of generality that the opposite thing is also a bijection. Because otherwise, I could have applied the symmetric case. So that means that for every element, for every generator, multiplying by the to the right gives a, gives a permutation, multiplying to the left gives a permutation. This is true for every generator, so it's also true if you multiply two elements which have this property, it's also it's preserved under multiplying. So it's true for every element of the uh, monoid. So I have, an element, uh, I have a monoid which has the property that uh, multiplying to the right by m is a bijection, multiplying to the left by m is a bijection, and this means that it's a group. So you can see the proof here, but I don't go through it. It's very straightforward. Just do, uh, you can find this on, this, on, on, this, on, on, on the web page if you, if you want, okay? And therefore, we can apply the group case. So that finishes the proof of the factorization forest theorem. And we are going to use this uh, once in this lecture, but it's a, it's a beautiful theorem. It's, uh, it's very useful in many different places. And in a certain sense, I would say that it contains all the, semi, all the structural theory of semi-groups that you are likely to ever need to use. So just, if you intend to use the structural theory of finite semi-groups, just learn the, this factorization forest theorem and it's going to be all you need. Uh, I wanted to have some applications of it to evaluation of MSO formulas, but I don't think I want to do that now. It, the question was, is there a way to dynamically update those forests? And my answer was no, uh, because this is in contradiction to, uh, uh, well, there's no way to update them in constant time. Uh, updating them in logarithmic time, maybe. And maybe you could take it to log log n time or something. That would be consistent with the better Brometers and result, but I don't know. Uh, for, so the question is what about if you want maybe not constant, but log log uh, depth? It's a, it's a nice question. I, I have no idea. Yeah. So it would be, could be a good idea to have a look at that. The, the Peter Bromilterson's uh, uh, incremental uh, uh, update algorithm uh, and see does that correspond to some kind of uh, factorization. In incidentally, uh, you can write an automaton version of this theorem, which says for every automaton, for every DFA, and actually for every NFA, we can have a constant depth 3 decomposition subject to certain natural conditions. It's easier to prove than the <laughs> it's easier to prove than this theorem. It's more powerful and gives better results. So <laughs> it's better. However, somehow it's the same monoid one which was proved first. So it is an example of this phenomenon. That the, the monoids they come they come first. Okay, let me go now to the second part of my lecture, which is 
Yes, what is it? <laughs> uh, it should be here. So uh, now we're going to go to, we, we did finite words, and now we're going to go to infinite words. And we're going to develop the appropriate notion of monoids and try to see what happens there. <laughs> the ultimate result that we're going to prove is that the following problem is decidable. You're given an MSO sentence with order and the alphabet. Here I use a three element alphabet, but that it's, it's of course uh, unimportant. And we want to know, is it true in some infinite word labeled by this alphabet? Now, what do I mean by infinite word? So there's several different interpretations of this expression, and we will study them one by one. Okay? The first notion would be, it's, it's an, uh, the positions are the natural numbers. So this is the classical notion of a an infinite word, also known as an omega word. So it's like A, B, A, 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 and then so on forever. But it does have a first position. It doesn't have a last position, but it, it's, it's uh, apart from that, it's, that that's, a, that's one thing you could do. A different notion, a more general notion, would be it's, it's not necessarily omega. It, it's a total order, the positions. It's countable. And it has another condition which is scattered, and I'll explain what that is later on. But before I say what that is, I just one example is the integers are, are an example of a scattered. So you could imagine words which are infinite in both directions, indexed by the integers. And scattered is a generalization which is sufficient to cover the integers, but also a concatenation of two scattered orders is also a scattered order, so two copies of the integers and stuff like that. That's going to be the second notion of infinite words that I was going to use. And there will be a third one which is going to be the most general one, which is an arbitrary countable order. So your positions are any countable, totally ordered set. Rational numbers, for example. It's not really for example, that's the only example, but uh, <laughs> which we'll discuss in a moment. That, that's the main example. Then you could say, well, you know, why countable? Well, that's sort of where it ends. Because uh, there's this uh, famous theorem of, of Shalach, which says that the following problem is undecidable. You're given an MSO sentence which only talks about the order, and you want to know, is it true in the real numbers? Now, the real numbers with order and the rational numbers with orders, they look kind of the same. So for first order logic, they're the same. But for MSO, they're not the same. And this difference, it's very subtle. <laughs> it's not so easy to, I mean, you know, well, dedicated cuts. So there's a, uh, the, the classical property that differentiates the rational numbers from the real numbers is that uh, in the real numbers, uh, every uh, uh, set has a supremum in the real numbers. This is not true in the rational numbers. And this is a property that's expressible in MSO, and therefore that, that gives you the difference. It's not expressible in first order logic. So it's a different theory, but you would think that it's kind of the same, but it's definitely not the same. <laughs> Okay, so this is a theorem. I will not prove this theorem. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very beautiful result, and it, 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 it's very difficult to prove. So you, can't, you won't be able to go beyond, well, certainly not for all, all orders, and actually beyond countability, the problems really, they appear. But we will study these three things. So there's, let's begin with Buhi. So it's just omega words. And actually, let's not begin there. Let's just not do it, OK? So the classic thing to do is Buhi Automata. You will see this uh, uh, tomorrow, I think, with, 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 with what well, we've already seen it with Moshe, and you'll see more, I guess, tomorrow. But we will not use Automata. We're going to use algebra. And the algebra that we're going to use, we could define it, the first case, the special case of omega words, but the more general case of scattered words will be just as easy to define and it will be a bit more elegant. So I'll just go directly there, okay? So omega words, we're not going to do. We're going to go directly to these scattered countable words and I'll explain what that is right now, okay? So let's assume for the moment that our notion of infinite word is a countable scattered order. I'll explain what that means labeled by some letters, and it's going to cover the, the integers. So uh, what is a scattered order? 
This is a notion that drew, I think, at these two houses, it originated with Hausdorff in the early 20th century or earlier, maybe. It's a very simple notion. It's an order is scattered if you cannot find a dense order inside it. So you cannot eliminate positions such that after the elimination, it's dense. That's being scattered. You, you cannot find a dense suborder. Okay? Yes. So that, that one has to be careful. So, for, uh, so here's an example. You might think that uh, a scattered order means that everybody has a successor or something. That's not true. For example, if you take the rational numbers, and you, which are clearly not scattered because they're dense already, and you substitute for each rational number a copy of the integers, then everybody will have a successor and a predecessor, but it's not going to be scattered because just by, yeah, it's, 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 you can remove points and get the rational numbers. So having successors and predecessors is, 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 is kind of similar uh, in spirit to being scattered, but it's not the same thing, okay? So, I mean, can I just make sure I understand? Uh, it seems, uh, uh, would, would this also work? So if you had um, the set consisting of uh, the points one, a half, a quarter, and so on, you, you just kept those guys, um, then, uh, and, uh, and you include, um, uh, you include zero, Zero does not have a successor, but that's not scattered, right? No, but uh, that, that, is, is scattered. that is scattered. That is scattered. That is scattered because the set that you have described is the same thing as you take omega, you add a limit element, and then you reverse it. And uh, so, for example, if you and I will give you an, a characterization of scattered orders, which is more. This is a negative characterization. It says does not contain something, but I will give you a positive characterization, which is going to be much easier to use. Okay, and this is what we're going to use. Uh, so. Uh, and we will write sigma to the power of diamond. This is like a generalized star. It's the set of all words where the positions are some scattered order. So for example, you're allowed to use the integers as your positions. That's an example of a scattered order. You're allowed to use other scattered orders. I'll give you examples in a moment. So that's our notion of infinite words, okay? Uh, to be completely uh, formal, these are uh, words up to isomorphism, which means if I have uh, two different representations of the same word in the sense that I rename the positions, um, but I keep the same labeling, that's the same thing. Let's give some examples. So every finite word is scattered. The positions are a, a countable order of four positions. Doesn't embed any denser order. If I take an omega word, such as this one, it's scattered. It's scattered and countable, or it's clearly countable. And you cannot embed the rational numbers. Another one, it's insensitive to reversing. So if you contain the, as you look at the definition of being scattered, you reverse the order, it's still scattered. So if you take the reverse omega word, that's still scattered. You can concatenate two things. So for example, if you concatenate these two things, you get a, b by, by the, uh, to, mm, to the integer power. That's also scattered. You could concatenate this word with itself, so you could get something like this, and so on. In particular, if you're an ordinal, then uh, you are necessarily scattered because you cannot embed the rational numbers in an ordinal because otherwise you would get a decreasing sequence. So all countable uh, ordinals are a special case of uh, scattered uh, uh, countable words. And in general, all ordinals in general are a special case of scattered orderings in general. And actually, Hausdorff proved uh, that it's, well, we'll get to that later. A non-example is the one that I just mentioned. You take the rational numbers and for each point you substitute the integers. This is not scattered, okay? In general, rational numbers you cannot use. Okay, so that's example, and this, this is our notion of, 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 of infinite word. It's nice in the sense that it contains omega words, but you can also substitute them in each other, you can concatenate them, which you cannot do for omega words. So in this sense, they're a bit more robust, they're, they're like closer to, to words. In you cannot concatenate two omega words and get an omega word. And uh, what I will show now, using algebraic methods, is that the following is decidable. You are given an input, an alphabet, and an MSO sentence which talks about order and its labels. And you want to know, is this sentence true in some scattered, countable order labeled by sigma? 
That's what we're going to prove. This generalizes the Buhi result about MSO on omega words because uh, uh, you can, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's explain this, why? So for example, consider the following MSO pro formula which inputs a, a countable, uh, an order and says that it's ill-founded. You just directly formalize the definition of, it. Can, uh, I say something stronger than ill-founded. I say, no, no, I, actually I say it's ill-founded. I say there exists a subset such as for every element in the subset, there's a smaller one also in the subset. That's the same thing as, as, as being ill-founded. That's a counterexample to, to well-foundedness. Uh, in, infinite decrease in the chain. And then, uh, using that, you can say that it's something is infinite. Because if you are infinite, then you have to be, uh, you have to be uh, mm, not well-founded, or your reverse has to be not well-founded. Because a chain is infinite if and only if it has an, an increasing subchain or a decreasing subchain. It's not difficult to show. So you can axiomatize finiteness here. You can also axiomatize that you're equal to omega. I think you have to say that there's no proper subset which contains the first position and is closed under successors. And uh, that means that you're omega. Using these things, you can see that uh, if you can decide if a f MSO formula is true in an arbitra arbitrary scattered countable ordering, you can also uh, ask if it's, if, if it's true in, 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 this, in one which is uh, of the form omega by just saying your original formula plus equal to omega. You can also ask is, uh, is, 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 is phi true in some finite ordering by using uh, the axiomatization of finiteness. So this generalizes these results but it gives you a little bit more. Okay. So this is the result that we're going to prove, and for, to prove it, we're going to use algebra. And I explain uh, what does that mean. So there's going to be three steps. First of all, I will define what is the appropriate notion of algebra for scattered countable linear orders. Okay, that's my first step. Then my second step, I'm going to uh, present to you uh, something called Hausdorff's theorem. I mean, there's many Hausdorff's theorems, but a theorem by Hausdorff, which describes the structure of scattered chains in a way which is going to be convenient for us. It's going to be a positive characterization of scattered chains. And then, combining Hausdorff's theorem with a Ramsey argument, we are going to get uh, a result which will be sufficient to, to, to prove this. Okay, so that's the three things that I want to do. And uh, let's begin. So let's begin by saying, what is the notion of monoid? So what is a monoid for scattered countable linear orders? Well, it's the following thing. You give the universe of the monoid, and then you give an associative multiplication operation. And now here, it's a very important part in the lecture. So please, uh, uh, yeah, pay, please pay attention, because this is the, the type of thing that we're going to be doing later on several times. Uh, what does it mean, what does this mean? Associative multiplication operation. So for a normal monoid, an associative multiplication operation took two arguments, produced one output argument, and had to be associative in the same sense of rotation. What does it mean for such structures to be associative? And I explain it right now. So uh, uh, let's do it first as a warm up uh, for normal monoids, let me give an alternative definition of associativity, not the binary operation, which is going to generalize well. So, if you have a monoid, you can view the multiplication operation not as a binary operation, but as an operation of unbounded arity, which inputs a lot of monoid elements and just takes the product. Okay? So, you could think of a monoid as being a as an under a universe plus an unbounded arity multiplication operation. And then you need to say, what does it mean to be associative? And here's uh, what it means. It means the following thing. So what does it mean for such an operation to be associative? It's the following thing. If I take a word of words and I flatten it to a normal word by just removing the parentheses, there's many different ways I could parenthesize a word into a word of words, yes? Many different ways of grouping things. And associativity says that no matter how I group them and I do the multiplication, it doesn't affect the result. What does it formally mean? If I take a word of words, 
One thing I could do is I could flatten it to a normal word and then multiply it and get an element in the moment. But what I could alternatively do is I could multiply it inside the parentheses. And then I would get a word, just this star would be inherited from the outer more star. And then I could multiply it again. So you have a word of words, and the smaller words you can just squash into single letters by the multiplication operation, and then you get just a, a sequence of elements and you squ squash it again. And associativity says that no matter how you group your words into groups, you always get the same result. That's associativity. Okay, so it may be on a picture, I have a word of words. One thing I could do, uh, and the picture is messed up, so I want to do it maybe. Maybe I quickly do it like this. This way, I first flatten it, I remove the parentheses and then I multiply it. The alternative strategy is I multiply each group here into one element, so I get three elements, and then I multiply it, and it should be the same result. So no matter how I group this into groups, no matter how I factorize it, I apply the multiplication operation, I get the same result. That's what it means to, to be associative, and if you think about it, it's the same thing as the classical notion of associativity, but expressed in a slightly different way. Yes? It does have identity built into it, uh, if you think about it, yes. That, so the answer to your question is yes. Uh, but I, I, I won't go there. Uh, I mean, okay, no, I, I will. It has identity because you could take the empty word of empty words. And then that means that, well, you get the empty word again, and that means you should have some element here which corresponds to the empty word of empty words. And then if you in, reinsert that into this argument, you will see that multiplying by the identity doesn't affect anything. So that implicitly gives you the identity. If instead of star it was plus, so non-empty words, you would not recover the identity from that. And that's the beauty of this diagram, is that you can write it for star, for plus, and also for diamond. You can write it for anything, and that's what we're going to do in the third lecture. We're going to write this diagram for various shapes of star, okay? And it's just the same thing all the time. So. What does it mean for a multiplication operation to be associative? It means I take a countable scattered order, and in each letter I have a countable scattered order. And then I could flatten it to a countable scattered order, and then multiply it. Or I could multiply each letter and get something like this, and multiply it, and then get this again. That's what it means. Now, to justify this, one needs a little bit of effort. So, for example, one should say that if I have a countable scattered order of countable scattered orders, and I flatten it, I get again a countable scattered order. And if you think about it, it's true. So, if countability is preserved. If you have a countable order, countably many countable things, it's countable again. And then if you think about scatteredness, it's also true, because if I could embed the rational numbers here, I could either embed it into one of the letters or into the whole thing. It, it takes a little bit of, of effort, but it's true. So that's what it means to be a, a, a monoid for this diamond operation. Okay? And I, 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 I deliberately wrote it like this because now you can imagine this going on, being used for other diamonds. And it's going to work as well. Okay? So that's the algebra. This is not a very computational definition. Because what does it say? It's a, it's a, it's a finite, well, for example, a finite monoid. It's a finite set together with this operation. And how do you even write it down? I mean, it's an operation which has uncountably many arguments. You can't write the multiplication table down. We will get to that issue later on. We will see that you actually can write the multiplication table, but this, is, this requires uh, arguments. And now, once we have that, uh, oh, sorry, I'm going back. We can now talk about recognizable languages. A set of countable scattered order uh, chains is recognizable if it's recognized by a homomorphism from all chains into a finite algebra of appropriate type. Again, I should say what it means to be a homomorphism. Now, I will do this uh, a, a little bit in detail now because it's less obvious, so let's do it. What does it mean to be a uh, homomorphism of algebras of this type? 
Well, you have to preserve the structure. Now, for normal monoids, if you use the original definition, it just said you have to preserve the binary operation than the unit. Now the operation has large arity, so you have to be a bit more detailed about how to do it. So let's do it in a bit more detail. What's a homomorphism? So a homomorphism is a function from two algebras. So it goes from one algebra to another algebra. And it is, preserves the structure of the algebra in the following sense. If I have a, a chain here, I could do two things. I could replace each element, I could multiply it in the source, in the input algebra, and then I could apply the homomorphism, or I could replace each letter by the letter in the output algebra, and then multiply in the output algebra. And it should be the same result. So applying the multiplication on the input or the output doesn't matter. That's what it says. So technically speaking, what we're talking about here is a function which inputs a chain, and then to each letter it applies it. And then if you think about the special case of this... What are you now mapping into what? You should be mapping one homomorphism, one monoid to another one, right? Yes, so formally speaking, a homomorphism is... is you, uh, to define a homomorphism, you need to give two algebras, the input algebra and the output algebra. And no, 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 it's two. Uh, and, uh, but this is fixed, yes, this diamond is fixed. Diamond is fixed, so you have n diamond and n diamond. I have n diamond and n diamond, so formally speaking, there's an algebra, so it consists of a universe and the multiplication operation. That's, so I have the input uh, algebra and I have the output algebra. I have an, a function H, which is a candidate to be or not be a homomorphism, it takes the universe of the input algebra to the universe of the output algebra. So as usual, I sort of, I sort of use the same letter for the algebra and its universe. And then a function from the universe of the input algebra to the universe of the output algebra is called a homomorphism if it makes this diagram commute. Okay, that's the definition. What is the diagram? So in order to write this diagram, you need to provide the input algebra, the output algebra, and H. And so in the input algebra, there is a multiplication operation. And if you remember what the multiplication operation of the algebra here is, it's a function of this vertical type. That's exactly what the multiplication operation is, an arrow of the vertical type. So that's your, that's your input algebra. This is your output algebra. Here's your function. In the diagram, the only missing part in the diagram is the topmost thing. So the topmost thing is, 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 is notation. It says, if I have a function from some set n to some set m, I can lift it to chains in the obvious way. Just apply it pointwise to every label. And if you think of this diagram, and instead of diamond, you substitute star. What does it say? You have a word in the input monoid, and then you either multiply it in the input monoid and apply the homomorphism, or to every letter you apply the homomorphism and then you multiply it. It's exactly the same thing, but for a gen more general notion of words. So it's, it's, it's please, thanks for asking this question. It's very important that you understand the definition. Okay, because we're going to use the spirit multiple times. And then we're going to write it using, yeah, you, I'm going to say it's a notion from category C or something. So, so it's very important. You have some notion of words, n to the diamond, and then you can apply pointwise a function to this general generalized notion of words, and you can multiply and to have a homomorphism. This is what it says. Okay? So it's, it's a way of writing a homomorphism in this in general sense. Uh, are there do all the orders have to be in M diamond? I mean, all the scattered orders can appear? So you could de define a different notion of diamond, like diamond prime, where you use only some scattered orders. A natural notion for diamond prime would be well-founded countable orders. So subset, uh, and you could write this for, for this other notion of diamond. This would also make sense. Not every subset would be good. It would need to be preserved under 
not every subset would be good. We'll see what, 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 what subset we're going to look at. The thing that puzzles me is that usually I think about it in the following way. You can, multi you can map and multiply, or multiply and map, and you'll get the same, the same thing. That's exactly what it's supposed to say. Except that multiply is not now not a binary operation, but an operation of very large arity. And the arity, it's not just how many arguments, but what is the, uh, what is, what's the topology of the arguments, yes? Thanks, that, that's a very good way of saying it. So you think of the multiply as not a binary operation, but an operation which has a set of arguments with a topology on it and it multiplies. In but, this case, it's... But when you multiply in, in a, when you multiply two elements in n diamond, what, what do you get? So, yeah, it's a, it's a very, this I think I should fit here. So multiplication usually keeps you in the Mamy same... Mamy tablicę, czy taką... Multiplication keeps you usually in the same monoid, right? And, and homomorphism takes you to another monoid. That's why I'm still confused about this. Okay. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's very important that this, is, this, this, this comes across. Okay, so uh, and it's, uh, I, I want to... Uh, uh, my definition of a scattered monoid is, let's write it as underlined, it's a universe plus a multiplication operation of this type. Inputs uh, a chain and it squashes, it takes the product. So it inputs, not only it has lots of, lots of value. Now, if I have two elements of the universe, this structure gives me a lot of implicit structure. So for example, I could ask, what does it mean, what is this? This can be viewed as syntactic sugar for the following thing. Given M and N, I can construct the chain which has first label M and then has second label N. This is a scattered countable chain. Two element order, very simple one. And to such a chain, I can apply the multiplication operation and get some result. So I can think of this this way. I can do this for three elements as well. And now you might want to ask, does the oper binary operation defined this way, does it satisfy the classical associativity axiom? And if you think about it and you look at this diagram, it does. But there's a lot of other operations that you can also define. One example would be, we'll get there actually, is m omega. If you take an element of a scattered count, uh, of, of such an algebraic structure, you can think of a special case of a chain which looks like this. That, that's a very good example of a chain. And you can multiply it and get it down to a single element. And that's, that's that. You can also have reverse omega. So you, there's a lot of implicit operations which fall out of this very generalized product operation. If this was not this, but this was this, well, you, wouldn't ha you would still have this. You wouldn't have this. Okay? But what you would have, it's, it's not difficult to show that if you have this generalized operation, it's actually uniquely determined by the binary one. Because if you want to multiply, uh, evaluate a word of length 10, you just bracket it uh, recursively and apply binary operation. In the more general structure, it's not uniquely determined by the binary operation, but maybe, you know, maybe there's some redundancy in the representation. No, we're not going to. That would make sense, yes. So this is a very abstract definition, and that's why it's very important to talk about it at length, okay? So what's going to happen to my lecture, we're not going to have graphs. 
But I think that's fine. I mean, better to understand something than to better to understand a small set than to not understand a big set. Is yeah. so. I want to go very slow and please, please ask questions because this, this is a little bit abstract here. Okay. Okay. So that that's our algebraic structure, and we have this notion of recognizability. It's recognized. A, 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 a language is recognized if it's a recognized. A language of, stro of, of more general words is recognized, right, recognizable if it's recognized by a homomorphism in suitable notion into the suitable type of algebra. And uh, it's, it's not so easy to define such algebras. It was already annoying to do it for monoids because you would have to give us uh, the, 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 the binary operation and prove this associativity axiom, this one. Now, if you want to go to this much more general, it's, 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 it's infinitely more inconvenient because you have to show this very general associativity property. And that's where it becomes very useful to have a different uh, alternative definition, which uses this notion of compositionality, which I think is, 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 is easier to handle. And we will see this, for example, in the example of uh, NSO. Okay? So instead of def defining such things, we're going to use compositional functions. So let me explain what that is. So uh, we have a function like this. It goes from these generalized infinite words to some set, typically finite set. And what I want to say is that it's, what does it mean for this function to be compositional? So it, to a generalized infinite word, it, it assigns a value, and I want to say it's compositional, which means that if I decompose an in, a generalized infinite, and, and I'll, I'll just use the word infinite word, okay? If I decompose an infinite word into smaller pieces, and I know the values on those pieces, then that allows me to give the value on the whole thing. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Compositionality. And if you think about it, it's this diagram. <laughs> so let's see this diagram. It says that if I have a, I have this, I have this word, and I can decompose it into a word of words. In many different ways. There's many different ways of decomposing a word into words of words. It's like putting brackets on it, yes? And if I have this word of words, what I could do is to each piece, each, 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 each contents of each bracket, each smaller piece, I could apply this allegedly compositional function. And then I get a, a word of values from the set end. So that's, that's the pieces. That's the values on the pieces, yes? So I, I decompose my infinite word. Maybe I will draw it here. I have this generalized infinite word, and I have decomposed it into pieces. That's my infinite word. So here I decompose it into three pieces. But in general, I could decompose it into infinitely many pieces. Yes, that, that's OK. And uh, what I could do is I could first just remove the parentheses. That's what's going on on the vertical side. Yes, I just remove the parentheses. And I could evaluate the function h and get some element. What I could also do is I could just evaluate h here. One particular thing it means that even though I start thinking about, let's say, about infinite words, and I decompose it, I may have to deal with finite words, right? Yes. Typically, the decompositions are going to have brackets which contain finite words. Yes. And then, so that, this is what this H diamond means. If this gave me, say, M1, M2, M3, then the result is M1, M2, and M3. In general, it's not necessarily three. It could be, like, infinitely many pieces, yes? together with some topology, as, as Joel says, yes? And compositionality says that if I have this, in order to know this value, it's enough to know the values on the pieces and their topology. That's what compositionality says. So formally, if it says, if you know this, you know this. That means there's a function here, which from this, from the values on the pieces and their topology will give you the value on the whole. OK? And that's exactly what it says here. It says, 
a function, this function is compositional. If there exists some function which from the p values on the pieces and their topology recovers the value on the whole. So these are the type of the, the diagrams like this, you need to look at them for a long time and then they're just very beautiful. And, and actually, it's, it's a very brief diagram, it's, uh, but it says exactly what you want to say. Okay? So that's a compositional function. And now we have the same principle. Compositional functions are the same thing as algebras. So if I have a compositional function like this, then the lemma says, if it's surjective, that's a technical condition, then you can equip this set with some multiplication operation Actually, it's this. This is exactly the multiplication operation, which makes it into an algebra and makes this function the homomorphism. So it's just compositional functions. And compositional functions are, I think, a much more intuitive object. You know, if you know the values on the pieces, you can know the value on the whole. That's a very intuitive thing. And we'll see that in a second. Uh, I don't remember if it's on the slides. If it's not, then. Uh, uh, the, there is a name for it called referential transparency. So the, the meaning, the meaning, it's an important principle in semantics, right? The, the meaning of something determined fully from the meaning of the component. And the way that they're put together. So this is this topology as well, yes? So that, that, that I, I thought it was called composition, compositionality. Okay, so that, that's the principle at work here. That's what's being formalized right now. So let's give a very important example of a compositional function. Namely, I take a chain, I have, and I associate to it its MSO type of quantifier rank 5. Uh, as you know, this is the same thing as the equivalence class under ehrenfeucht freise equivalence. And I want to show that this function is compositional. What does that mean? That means that if I have a chain, and I know the ehrenfeucht freise type here, I know the ehrenfeucht freise type here, I know the ehrenfeucht freise type here, then that uniquely determines the ehrenfeucht freise type of the whole thing. And it's the exact same duplicator strategy copying argument that achieves this. It's very easy to see. So this is a compositional thing. If you know the ehrenfeucht freise type of the pieces, you know the ehrenfeucht freise type of the whole thing. Okay. Uh, so I think let's take a, maybe a short break now. Uh, yes, yes, Michal. We will have this later on, and uh, we'll just we'll prove this. Uh, but that's not your question. <laughs> uh, the question was, what is the intuition? Uh, well, what the intuition is this. This is an operation, and I want to say it's associative. That's what I want to say. Yes, that, that. So what I do is to prove if you, if you unravel the meaning of associativity, uh, that means that no matter how you parenthesize it, something, something. But then what you do is you say if it's surjective, then actually instead of thinking of something here, I can take it back there. And then use the assumption that it's associative over there, and use this diagram and get it. So that's uh, essentially, if you have a compositional function uh, from something which is associative, in this particular case, the set of all chains, and it's compositional, then it, it has to be compositional uh, after, after this, this thing. So we'll see the proof later on. But we, we have a notion of an algebra for our more general infinite words. But so far, it's not very helpful for decision algorithms. Remember, our goal was to prove uh, uh, our goal was to prove decidability of MSO using such algebras, and we're pretty far away from that because we have an algebra such that the multiplication operation has uncountable size, and you know that's not very useful. We have to get around those problems, and, and we will. That's where some combinatorics are going to be used. And you necessarily need to use combinatorics somewhere because here, you see, we have this, this diamond with scattered countable chains. 
why be so specific? Why scattered countable chains and not just arbitrary chains? Not necessarily scattered, not necessarily countable. All of this would make sense. And yet it's undecidable by Schellach. So there's something special about scattered and countable. And we will have to exploit that at some point, and we will in a moment. Okay? Uh, but let's just, just continue a little bit with the, the basic theory. Uh, so this is the thing that I said uh, a moment ago, uh, is that if you take the MSO type function, you fix a quantifier rank, and then you associate to an infinite word the equivalence class under the relation duplicator can win k rounds. Then just by doing the exact same proof as we did before, I said there were two pieces, but it could be more than two pieces, it's going to be a compositional function. And for this particular result, countability and scatteredness is not, not irrelevant. It's just true for very simple basic reasons. The, the, the fact that it's a linear order is important, though. But so, it, it's a compositional. It's very easy to see if you use the Ehrenfeucht Freise definition. Okay. Uh, and that means that because it's a compositional function, then this set is an algebraic structure of the appropriate type, and this is a homomorphism. And therefore, what we get as a corollary is that. Uh, every language definable in MSO is recognized by this homomorphism and therefore it is recognized by a finite algebra because this is a finite set uh, as for the same reasons as we discussed before because uh, an uh, K-type is a set of MSO formulas and there can only be finite in many ways to do it. So this gives you the implication from MSO definable to recognizable. And you see it's a very transparent construction. And it, Countability is irrelevant, scatteredness is irrelevant. It's, it's very transparent. The question I have is that if you look at, at omega words, right, they have this asymmetry. Mm -hmm. right? that however you decompose it, it has to be the, the finite word and then the infinite word. And infinite word you can only glue on the right. And how did this disappear here, this asymmetry here? Well, the, the reason I... So, uh, I'm not sure I want to, I, I, let me magnify it here. Uh, and uh, I could have done it for omega words, but there it's a little bit less elegant, uh, because if you, mm, because the basic notion, you chose words for, good reason. for a certain reason, there, it could be avoided, but uh, the basic, if you, if, let's recall the, maybe let's, let's, let's take, let's go back a little bit to the definition of a monoid. Here it is. It says that this thing commutes. If I take a word of words, then blah, blah, blah. For finite words, it's okay. A word, a finite word of finite words is a finite word. For scattered countable things, it's okay. A scattered countable word of scattered countable words is a scatter. But an omega word of omega words is not. So that's why I did it. You could avoid, you could, you could, you could, Avoid this obstacle in two ways. First of all, you could give an inelegant way of flattening an omega word into, uh, of omega words into an omega word. You say, I have an omega word of omega words. Sorry, you, uh, you, go, you go not to omega, but to at most omega. And you say, if you have an at most omega word of at most omega words, how do you flatten it? As long as you have finite words, you concatenate them, and the first infinite word, it ignores the rest. That will work. It's not very elegant, but gets the job done. Another way which would be, I think, more appropriate would be you say that you live in a two-sorted universe of finite words and omega words. And then that would work, and this morally corresponds to, 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 Rilke, uh, to Rilke things. But I didn't want to use either one or the other, so that's why I, 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 I went. I did what I did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where were we? We know that uh, every MSO definable language is recognized by a finite algebra. But finite algebras are an incredibly complicated object because they have these huge multiplication tables and that's not useful at all for algorithms. 
And for that, to get algorithms, we will need to have closer inspection of the structures of such algebras, and we will discover that the multiplication tables are formally speaking uncountable, but in fact, there's a lot of redundancy there, and uh, they can be represented in a finite way, and that's what we're going to do now, okay? And this is what will fail if you go to not necessarily countable, not necessarily scattered ordinates. There will be finite algebras, but there's not going to be any way of representing them in a finite way. Yes? So, it doesn't help too much. So, uh, the study of the MSO theory of well orders, not necessarily countable ones, is, is, is uh, now, I think, slightly forgotten, but it was the, one of the original big things. So, like when Buhi proved it for omega, then, you know, the, the later papers were about other things, like, you know, omega to the power of omega and stuff like that. And all countable ordinals, for example. And uh, there was that. And then even un some uncountable ones. And there's a lot of very nice work going on there. Now, a little bit forgotten. When you go beyond countable ordinals, you start hitting some trouble. Uh, so there exist uncountable ordinals such that in order to decide their MSO theory, that depends on the axioms of set theory that you choose, you, you get into things like that. Sorry, I mean, in the spirit, I just, uh, maybe it's a little bit of a crazy question, but so if you, if you go beyond scattered, you say you hit this, uh, this very... No, mainly question. if you go beyond countable. If you go beyond, beyond... So scattered, as we will see in a later part of the lecture, can be lifted. So. If you, just, uh, uh, if you just do countable, not necessarily scattered, it's going to be fine. The structural theory will require a little bit more combinatorics. That's why I want to do it in a second phase. But the, the, the countability is very important. Okay, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking in terms of this. Uh, so if you look at MSO over the reals, if you require predicates to have finite variability, then you recover decidability. And so, and now this is just speculation, but if you required actually the discontinuity to be a, a scattered set, then presumably you could move, uh, presumably you, you, you would still have. That's a very interesting question. I, 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 I don't know, but that, uh, that, that, that's, that seems possible. Definitely the undecidability proof uh, quantifies over sets which are <laughs> crazy <laughs> and uh, not scattered variability in any way. So that, that, that could be the case and could be an instance of some more general principle that is just the variability that counts in some way. That, that's mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I want to underline, I'm very happy about these questions because, yeah, you know, otherwise you can just read a book. I mean, it's, uh, so, so please feel free to, to ask questions all the time. Uh, okay, so we have these, these monoids. And now we're going to discover that they, have, uh, they, have, they can be finitely represented. And for that, we're going to uh, use two things, this Hausdorff theorem and then some Ramsey stuff. And using these two things, I will describe that as well. We will discover that actually, if you remember uh, when I was answering Moshe's question, there in an in a algebraic structure like this, there were some implicit operations. There was binary concatenation and there was, for example, omega power. And there was reverse omega power. And I did not write these things randomly. Because as we will discover, these are the only three things you need to know. So there will be a theorem which says that if you have such an algebraic structure, then it's uniquely determined by its binary power, its omega power, and reverse omega power. And in particular, it can be represented in a finite way by the multiplication operation of these two operations. M multiplication table of these two operations. But to prove that, we will need to understand a bit more and do some combinatorics, and that's what we're going to do right now. So let us begin with Hausdorff's theorem on scattered orders, and which allow you to understand them better. I think I should have placed it before this, because this would give a better intuition on the type of objects we're doing. So that was a bad order, because it's independent. Sorry. So let's say have this. 
So this is a, so if you remember the definition of a scattered order was negative. You don't have a dense, but it's, it's useful to have a positive characterization and here it is. So every countable scattered chain can be constructed as follows. You either have a, an empty chain or a single letter, or you can concatenate two simpler chains, omega concatenate simpler chains or reverse omega concatenate simpler chains. It's, it's not the omega power, different chains, yes? So that's all you can get. So you start with chains of length at most in the one, you can concatenate two, or you can put them in an omega fashion in one way or the omega fashion in the other way. And that's all you can get. This is a much more positive <laughs> explanation of what's going on. I should have started with that, okay? Let's prove this here. It's not so difficult to prove. So Hausdorff proved something a bit more, uh, a bit stronger for uh, not necessarily countable ones and stuff like that, but this is all I need for the proof here. Uh, so in order to prove this, we're going to use a game characterization, which will be much easier to, to, to deal with. So consider the following game description of Hausdorff's theorem. We will have a, 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 a game you fix a chain and you want to know is it scattered or not. Okay? And there's going to be two players, players scattered, well, it's clear what his objective is, and uh, it, to prove that it is scattered. <laughs> and player spoiler, well, it's also clear what the objective of this player is, as usual. So, yes, so he should be called dense. So you start with your chain, and the dense player, the spoiler player says, uh, here's the middle of the rational numbers. And he claims, well, if it's dense, then you can split it into two parts such that it's dense here and it's dense here. That's what he's trying to say. So he's, spoiler picks a position and implicitly he's claiming it's dense here and it's dense here. And, well, so actually maybe the player should be called dense and spoiler. Yes? Because uh, yeah, spoiler is always a bad name. Yeah. So each so they, they should have been called scattered and dense. So now the scattered player says, "Ah, oh, no, Mr. Dense, you're wrong. Here is the part where you don't have the rational numbers." Okay, so he just picks. So spoiler says proposes two parts and just duplicate. Oh, just can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I did a few passes over the slides and I was looking for spoiler and duplicator and tried to rename them to other things, but you see, it, unsuccessful. So uh, now the scattered player says, here's your problem. And then this continues. So now here, the dense player picks a middle, the scattered player picks a side, they go on so ever, so forever. Okay? And it's a safety game for the dense player and the reachability game for the uh, scattered player. So the scattered player wants to get down to a single node or to an empty chain. And the duplicator, the dense player wants to just keep on doing it. So it's, it's not so difficult to see that a chain is scattered if and only if scattered has a winning strategy. Hey, you think about it, you unravel the definitions, it's, it's, uh, it's true. Using this game, we will, uh, uh, we will prove the Hausdorff theorem, okay? So, let's go. Uh, I want to, uh, so, I have a scattered chain, and I want to give it a decomposition as in the Hausdorff theorem. So I want to decompose it into a binary concatenation of two simpler scattered chains, or into a omega composition of two s of simpler scattered chains, or a reverse one, okay? But by this lemma, since it's scattered, the player scattered has a winning strategy. And now I'm going to use induction on the number of rounds. So player scattered wants to win in finite time, yes? So the induction parameter is how many rounds will player scattered take to win. So the induction parameter is uh, the number of rounds that spoiler can still survive. Now this is not a normal number. This is not like 10 or 12. It's, did I break something? I kicked something and then the sound changed. No? Okay, good. 
Uh, the number of rounds that uh, a spoiler can still survive is an ordinal number. I don't want to go into the details. If you know this type of thing, you know it. If, if you don't, just substitute the number of rounds left to survive. It's a well-defined parameter, and this is what we'll do induction on. So, and, uh, so let's just do it. So we have this, this, this scattered chain, okay? And we know that uh, there's some ordinal number. So in the game, is this a, is this a transfinite game or not? <coughs> A transfinite game, no, no, the number of rounds is omega. Number of rounds is omega. Yeah. Okay. Here you said ordinal number. So it's like in any uh, 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 reachability game, uh, you can associate to each, it's, uh, uh, each position uh, the, the number of rounds left to win, and then that's an ordinal number if, 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 you, if, you, if you work it out, as long as the, 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 game, the, the arena is infinite. So there are some details about games that I'm just, just going over. So the, the, but just think it's as something simplified. Okay, so we have this chain. I want to find the house of decomposition. So what do we know? We know that no matter... Uh, and we want to have this house of decomposition. Okay? So let's produce it. So it's a, it's a countable chain. So let's enumerate the positions. Okay? So here's the, you know... First position. It doesn't matter what enumeration we take. If it's the rational numbers, this this enumeration will skip around a lot. I mean, it's not going to be rational numbers because that's not scattered, but it can. It doesn't need to go forward all the time. I take the first position and I say, what would happen if this was the position chosen by player dense? Well, we know that the scattered player would choose one of the sides and say it's simpler. Yes. So, if player dense played this one. Then the scattered player, maybe he would respond here, and he would say, this is a simpler chain. So it's a simpler chain, uh, less time left to survive, so I can apply the induction assumption to it. Yes? So by induction assumption, here I can have a Hausdorff-like decomposition. And then, you know, let's take the second position, and I ask, what happens, what, what, what would be, so ignore this game for the moment, what would be if the first move was this? Then we know that the, uh, the, 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 the scattered player would choose one of the two sides and win there. So maybe here, so he could either choose the left side or the right side. So maybe it would be the left side again. So by induction assumption, we know that the entire prefix to the left of x2 is simpler, therefore it has a Hausdorff decomposition. If you have, if this has a Hausdorff decomposition, then in particular this part has a Hausdorff decomposition because it's, it's closed undertaking in fixes. I continue. You know, I take the third position. Maybe it's already here, then I ignore it. And maybe it's here, and then I reapply the argument. So suppose again it was the simpler part was to the left. So I add a new piece with a Hausdorff decomposition. If this would continue like this all the time, I would have an omega type decomposition, yes? But it might not be the case. It might be the case that, for example, if I take the fifth position, then the strategy of the scattered player will be to go in the other side. I mean, intuitively speaking, the more x is to the right, the simpler part is more likely to be to the right, yes? So if it's here, then probably the simpler part is going to be here. So we know this has a Hausdorff decomposition. And you continue this argument, if the new positions appear here, you ignore them, otherwise they appear here. And you get this, these two, uh, two, two sides converging towards the middle, and they exhaust it eventually because of an enumeration of all possible positions. So that's what you get, a binary concatenation of a plus omega and a minus omega. So we're done here. So that's the Hausdorff theorem, and I think I don't want to prolong uh, what we have. Uh, 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 we'll continue tomorrow, so just want to uh, remind you what we have. We have a notion of algebra, very abstract, doesn't use anything about scattered algebra. But then we know that uh, the notion of infinite word we have is actually has some special properties, combinatorial properties coming from Hauser's theorem. And we will use that to show that actually your algebras are not so rich, and they're uniquely determined just by these three operations, and for that we're going to use a Ramsey algorithm. 
And then once we have the Ramsey argument, we're going to conclude from that the decidability. And the point of this proof is to see that a lot of this proof is very generic. So that's, that's my intention, to, to give a proof that's very generic, which can be generalized later on. Okay, so that's, that's, so we will do that uh, tomorrow. So the plan for tomorrow is to finish this proof, number one. Number two, we will then uh, uh, generalize it to countable, but not necessarily scattered orders. There we will not have the Hausdorff theorem. So we will have to do some more combinatorics, but that will work out. And then by that time, I hope you will see that this notion of algebras, a lot of the algebra stuff is completely uh, generic. Some of it is combinatorial and specific, but some of it is generic. And the last part of my lecture is I will try to say, what can you say in general about the generic part? And I think I will not have time to go into the fourth part of the lecture, which is about graphs. So that's, that's the plan for tomorrow. So thank you.